Hello and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. I'm Virginia Prescott from GPB and the host of these talks. Tonight, a conversation with H.W. Brands about the zealot and the emancipator. John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, and the struggle for American freedom. You can purchase the book directly from Acapella Books. There is a link in the chat to the right of your screen, or you can also go to the link provided at the History Center's website. As Professor Brands and I are talking, please do submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Not the chat, please, just the Q&A. It tends to get less crowded that way. And I'm gonna try and integrate as many of them into the conversation as I possibly can. H.W. Brands is Chair of History at the University of Texas at Austin. He's authored some 30 books on U.S. history, among them The First American and his biography for FDR were both finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. Bill Brands, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Virginia. Delighted to be back at the Atlanta History Center, sort of. <laughs> sort of, kind of. Well, Abraham Lincoln and John Brown, both well covered by historians. What did you want to add to the understanding of these famous American martyrs, really, by writing about them together? I've been teaching American history for 35, going on 40 years. And the longer I teach, the more I'm convinced that some of the basic questions of history are essentially questions of values. They, they get down to almost moral questions. And there's a moral question at work here that goes beyond just John Brown and Abraham Lincoln, but I can summarize it in the lives of these two. And the moral question is, it's a timeless question that confronts citizens of any republic sooner or later. And that is, what does the good person do when he or she is convinced that the government is involved in something that is wrong or perhaps even downright evil. What do you do? And gen different generations confront this in different ways. I grew up during the 1960s and I was a teenager in the 1960s and college in the 1970s. And a pressing question that became a moral question for many people was the Vietnam War. And what do you do if you think that the Vietnam War is an immoral colonial war? Do you simply vote for somebody who will pull out of Vietnam? Do you march? Do you throw Molotov cocktails? What do you do? In the case of the 19th century, the mid 19th century, the pressing moral question of the day was slavery. And so what does a person, John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, what does a person who is convinced that slavery is wrong, wrong on policy grounds, wrong on moral grounds, wrong on social grounds, what does that person do about it? What obligation? does that person have? What responsibilities, what avenues are ethically open to that person? And I chose to look at John Brown because while they agree on this fundamental principle that slavery was wrong, they disagreed diametrically on what to do about it. Mm -hmm. John Brown believed in forcible direct action. He in effect declared war on slavery and did what he could to carry out, to launch the war. Abraham Lincoln eschewed violence. He thought that violence was counterproductive, it was bad policy, but it also was going to be ineffective. Abraham Lincoln chose the path of moderation, the, the path of politics. He believed that the issue of slavery could be effectively addressed only through constitutional means. And, and he was as committed to emancipation as John Brown was, but he thought that Brown was simply gonna make matters worse by going into the realm of violence and armed resistance. The only way, thought Lincoln, to bring slavery to an end in a way that preserved the union and gave the former slaves a, a chance at anything approaching equality was to do it through politics, through political means, through constitutional means. So John Brown takes a very different tack, as you said. He, very early on, he's a man of faith, gets radicalized in 1837 when uh, a prominent abolitionist was murdered by a mob, stands up in church and says, he's going to change things. He's going to devote his life to this. And he also comes up with a detailed plan for what he called the League of Gileadites to resist the Fugitive Slave Act. This was passed in 1950. So what was his vision for the League and was violence always a part of that plan or did he begin like Lincoln to think, well, we can do this in a different way? John Brown's views on slavery and emancipation, finally abolition, evolved over time. He was born in 1800. Lincoln was born in 1809. So Lincoln's a little bit younger. 
but they were both born at a time when slavery was considered by many people in the United States to be something of a necessary evil and how necessary and how evil depended on where you were. By 1800, most Northern states had eliminated slavery, not because they had been seized by a fit of morality, but because their economies had evolved in a way where slavery was unnecessary, if not downright counterproductive. So they could focus on the unsavory parts of slavery and say, we don't wanna have anything to do with it anymore. And, but Southern states, in fact, to the surprise of the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, James Madison, who all thought that slavery would effectively die out in the South the way it had died out, it was, it was dying out in the North, that didn't happen. Slavery became fixed more firmly upon the Southern economy with changes in the technology of the cotton industry and the growth of territory, land available to slavery. So. John Brown became increasingly discouraged at the future of the country on slavery. And in the 1830s, when the abolitionist movement really blew up in the North, John Brown was indeed radicalized by the murder of Elijah Lovejoy, an abolitionist editor who was killed by a mob. And John Brown thought that, wait, this has gone too far. The people who believe that slavery must and need to stand up, if the pro-slavery forces are willing to use violence as they were in the case of Elijah Lovejoy, then the anti-slavery side needs to take up arms as well. And that's when John Brown devoted himself to making war against slavery. At first the war was metaphorical, but quickly it became actual. So there are a number of things converging in the mid 19th century, as you said, this change in the economy in the North and in the South, but there's also the expanded settlement of the Western territories and growing influence of the abolitionist movement at odds with this powerful pro-slavery Southern planners. This all comes to a head in Kansas, which you write becomes the closest thing to a national referendum on slavery. So what is playing out on the ground in Kansas? Yes, so the hope of the forces opposed to slavery was that if slavery is contained, if it's not allowed to spread, then eventually it will die out because the opponents of slavery understood that what made slavery profitable in Virginia, in the East, in the Eastern slave states, was the fact that there was a market for slaves in the West. Take away that market of expansion, and then slavery would become uneconomic, and the slaveholders themselves would decide, okay, this isn't worth it anymore, we're going to be done. But that, that hope was foiled when the West was opened to slavery. Now, the West was not supposed to be open to slavery in 1820. There was a compromise between the Northern states and the Southern states, the Missouri Compromise, and it had to do with the admission of Missouri to the Union. Missouri was allowed to enter the Union as a slave state, but an agreement was made that in the rest of the Western territories, part of the Louisiana Purchase, slavery would be forever forbidden from the Northern part of the Louisiana Purchase, including what would become Kansas territory. But in 1854, Stephen Douglas, Democratic Senator from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln's home state, decided to push through a measure called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And this act, repealed that part of the Missouri Compromise and allowed Missouri to be open, excuse me, allowed Kansas territory to be open to the possibility of slavery under the principle of what Douglas called popular sovereignty, a great name, misleading, but a great name. He could sell it because it simply said that Kansas territory is open to whoever wants to come and settle it. And when there are enough settlers there, to justify forming a state, then the people there will call a constitutional convention. And if the convention says, the state of Kansas shall not have slavery, then the state of Kansas shall not have slavery. If the people at the constitutional convention say that Kansas should have slavery, then there will be slavery. In a democracy, what could be better than that? Well, in fact, what happened was, turned out that this, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the measure, invited the opposing sides, the pro-slavery forces, the anti-slavery forces to race to Kansas and see who could fill up the state, the territory first, so that when that constitutional convention was held, then their side would win. 
by the mid 1850s. So we're talking about 1855, 1856. By this time, the line had clearly been drawn between North and South on slavery as a moral issue, an overriding moral issue. And in the North, abolitionists took the position that we have to oppose the extension of slavery and anti-slavery settlement societies, free state immigrant societies formed in the North and people would give money to fund immigrants to go to Kansas territory where they would plant the flag for opposition to slavery. The South did something comparable. The South had an advantage because Kansas territory was right next to Missouri, a slave state. And the Missourians, the so-called border ruffians would go across the border into Kansas and they would terrorize the place. They would destroy the free state settlements, including the free state, they called them the free state settlements, settled by the opponents of slavery of Lawrence, Kansas. And they committed what was called the sack of Kansas. They just they basically destroyed the community. And the idea was to make Kansas unfriendly, downright hostile, dangerous to free state settlers. Mm -hmm. This is where John Brown comes in. Right. Because so he, John, he rounds up his party of sons and a few others to fight exactly. the border ruffians. Exactly. So John Brown, a very interesting character, he had 20 children. And by this time, about five of his sons were full grown adults, big strapping young men almost as committed to the anti-slavery cause as John Brown himself. And so they decide, the sons actually go first to Kansas and they are gonna, well, they're not initially gonna take up arms, but they're gonna take up space in opposition to slavery. And they get there and they say, basically they write home and say, father, you should come join us. And John Brown does. And John Brown is increasingly distressed at the failure of the anti-slavery movement, of the abolitionist movement to actually frustrate the pro-slavery forces. And John Brown is just appalled at the fact that the pro-slavery forces seem to be rolling right over physically by violence, rolling over the anti-slavery side. And following the destruction of Lawrence, Kansas, John Brown concludes that he needs to take strong action to send a message to the pro-slavery side. And so he gathers two of his sons and three other men. And in the dark of one night, they descend upon a pro-slavery settlement on Pottawatomie Creek. And they drag five men, pro-slavery settlers, from their beds and just outside the cabins where they're living they hack them to death with broadsword hmm. and they leave the mangled bodies and they ride off into the night. And John Brown's point was to let the pro-slavery side realize, if you try to use force in Kansas, we will use more force against you. Hmm. So this becomes known as the Pottawatomie Massacre, it was by the Pottawatomie Creek, a brutal crime. You know, men dragged out of their beds with wives screaming and, and sons uh, begging for their lives, hearing the murders of their fathers. It really is horrible. And, and it incites this call for war. Now, Brown never quite admits to the crime, but by now he's famous and infamous and he's a wanted man. And he and his militia of Kansas regulars are joined at different times by reporters from the New York Tribune. This is the pro-abolitionist newspaper run by Horace Greeley. But it's really interesting. We get a sense of the contemporary, contemporaneous look and opinion at John Brown. At what did they, how do they characterize him? And what does that do for his reputation? So there's a, there's a striking aspect of John Brown that the historian, me, has to try to come to terms with. How is this guy who, before he becomes famous in Kansas, was not much of a success at anything in life? And if he had been more successful in business as a farmer, he probably wouldn't have become the figure he became. He wouldn't have turned so fully to abolitionism, but he really never could make a success of anything in life before this. But there was something about his personality that drew people to him, that his sons, his sons, they were raised in the anti-slavery faith, but they feared their father. They didn't know what to make of him. He was, he had this really powerful personality. They couldn't 
leave him. They couldn't resist him, but neither could they buy entirely in. And they were very disturbed by what John Brown had made and was making them do, but they still couldn't leave. Reporters loved John Brown because in the first place, this was a great story. And these correspondents sent by the New York newspapers and, and other London news, uh, correspondents came from England, various other places. This was the big story. And in the days before, long, long before television, what they would do is they would write these very vivid stories uh, describing the characters and recounting the events that they saw. And John Brown was instinctively brilliant at dealing with the reporters because he was, to all appearances, utterly transparent, as honest as could be. In fact, he really wasn't, but he was one who understood that, that sincerity is so important that once you learn to fake it, then you've got it made. And John Brown would draw these reporters into his confidence. But they weren't the only ones who were drawn into John Brown's confidence. There was a, a network of abolitionists, abolitionist philanthropists centered, centered in Boston, but uh, spanning over into upstate New York. And these were men, typically, who were eager to support the anti-slavery cause. But they were in no position to take up arms. But they were enormously impressed by somebody who did like John Brown. And so they became the financial support of John Brown. And John Brown, he, they, nobody knew him from anybody else until the Potawatomi Massacre. Now, there was no direct evidence linking John Brown to the crimes because the people who were killed, nobody knew who this guy was. He was you know, just somebody. But eventually, evidence pointed to John Brown. And so the the federal authorities in Kansas territory put out uh, wanted posters for John Brown. But the trouble was in those pre-photography days, there was no picture on the poster. And so John Brown, all he had to do was grow his hair, or cut his hair, or grow his beard or cut his beard, change his name. And he wandered relatively freely around the North. Now, just as there was an underground railroad for escaped and escaping slaves, there was something comparable for people like John Brown anti-slavery militants. And so there were safe houses where he could stay on his way back east. And when he got back east to raise money for the Kansas project, he made a point of not admitting or denying that he had been behind the murders on Potawatomi Creek. And his supporters made a point of not asking him directly because they didn't really want to know if they, if they knew for sure that he was this cold-blooded murderer, then they would have had a hard time justifying giving him money to do more of the same. But if he simply was this militant, this strong-minded supporter of the cause, then fine, we'll give him his money. And it's remarkable, as I say, for the historian to try to figure out what it was that John, about John Brown that drew, these were intelligent people, these were, you know, well-traveled people, but it's almost as though he sort of spun this web that drew them all in. They were, he presented himself as the person that they could imagine themselves to be in their younger, braver days. Hmm. Yeah, uh, there's a similar effect when he's planning, after he leaves Kansas, after things sort of settle down, and he starts concocting this plan, which has been in effect for some time, to raise money to, to and men to incite slave rebellion in the South, going across the country. Um, you find accounts of people who he visited who regard this as lunacy, uh, some who just don't wanna know the plans. Frederick Douglass thinks it's lunacy, for example. And John Brown rejects all criticism. He's noted for his volcanic moods in, in some of the testimonials that you, you write about in the book, impulsive, maybe even delusional thinking that he's saving the world and generations to come. Uh, some pro historians have proposed that he's mentally ill. And we have a question here from Michael who says, was John Brown a fanatic who helped bring on the war or merely another voice against slavery? I'm interested in knowing your thoughts on this theory that he was actually mentally ill. The title of my book is The Zealot and the Emancipator. The Emancipator, I had no problem coming up with that label for Abraham Lincoln. He's known as the Emancipator. 
John Brown, I had to think, so what's the word that I can apply? I was tempted for a brief time, just a brief time, to say the terrorist and the emancipator, because he was indeed a terrorist. If he committed those crimes today, especially if it was for a cause that people didn't universally sign on to, well, okay. the definition of terrorism is somebody who commits violent acts for a political purpose. And that's exactly what John Brown did. But that was, there's too much sort of over, uh, contemporary overlay to terrorists. Fanatic, again, all right, that's a strong one. And I could have justified using that because he was a fanatic. Was John Brown crazy? Was John Brown insane? I would say definitely not certainly not in the sense of losing touch with reality. So he always understood what he was doing and why he was doing it. Now, he was perhaps more convinced that he knew exactly what God wanted him to do than let's say more self-questioning people do. But one of the reasons that John Brown was so persuasive was that people who encountered him knew that he was on the right side of history and on the right side of this fundamental moral question. And the test really comes, I don't wanna to anticipate too far here, but when he encountered Southerners, people who opposed everything that he stood for in a political way, he drew them in, he won them over because they thought they were dealing with someone who had the utter courage of his convictions. And that's something that is impressive to all sorts of people, even if you don't believe in the convictions. The fact that here's someone who at the risk of his life is following his belief in what is right to the logical outcome. Well, so you mentioned, let's go back to Lincoln for just a moment, because he said he said himself, I have no quarrel with Southerners. They didn't invent slavery. You know, they're living with it. Um, he is trying to make a, a an appeal against expanding slavery into the new territories that are being built in the West. You mentioned Stephen Douglas, of course, his rival in the Senate and for president. And I didn't know this, but for, for Mary Todd, I didn't realize that they were both courting Mary Todd at the same Springfield time. Springfield was a small town. <laughs> Exactly. Um, but there's a question here about Lincoln and, and in his where he comes, Sal asks, you know, says he loves your work, by the way, Lincoln was a railroad lawyer, a lot of capital invested in railroad, the return for that investment hinged upon selling cotton to Manchester, England, which outlawed slavery. So slavery had to end. Any motivation there, any connection that you can see there? No, I don't think so. And here's why. Because even after England outlawed slavery, the textile mills in Manchester had no problem buying Southern cotton. And in fact, if anything, emancipation or heaven forbid a war in the United States between the North and South would disrupt the supply of cotton. So Lincoln, Lincoln came to his conclusion that slavery was wrong from his early days. He was born in Kentucky, but the family moved across the Ohio River first to Indiana and then to Illinois. But Lincoln and his family were opposed to slavery initially on call it grounds of self-interest because for a working man, someone who made his living by manual labor in place like Southern Ohio, slavery simply meant that the wage rate would be far lower than it would be otherwise. Slavery was a threat to the self-interest of free working men. And so, but I mean, ironically, emancipation was too, because slavery depressed the price of labor, so the wages. But if all the slaves became free, then they would flood onto the market and they would keep the wage rate low. So working men in the North were kind of conflicted on this subject. They didn't know where to land on this one. But Lincoln had a moment relatively early in his life. He was a teenager. He was about 18 or 19 when he confronted slavery in a way that he never had before. So he grew up in the free states of Indiana and Illinois. And he then, um, he was aware of slavery because if you lived anywhere near the border with the slave region, in this case, Kentucky, you would encounter slaves because slaveholders 
would travel across the Ohio River into Illinois. Some of them had property in both states and they could bring their slaves over for a limited time and the slaves would actually work in Illinois. So Lincoln was aware of this, but Illinois didn't have any big slave markets. And as a, a teenager, Abraham Lincoln was hired to float a flat boat down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. This is, you know, see the world, make a little money. So we went to New Orleans and for the first time he saw a slave auction in full force. And the idea of this property and the sale of human flesh and these slaves were being sold just like one would sell horses or cattle. And Lincoln remembered that as the moment when he realized this just isn't right. And so he returned, but now he still had to make a living. And so he, as the, the questioner said, he took, he was a lawyer, he took his cases where they came from. He represented railroads. He occasionally would represent slave owners. Mm -hmm. And again, this is, you know, this is what lawyers do. But he increasingly became convinced that this had the United States on the wrong track. Now, for a lot of people, there, was, there had always been a fundamental contradiction between the promise of equality in the Declaration of Independence and the guarantee of the future of slavery in the Constitution. And squaring that circle was something that was a project for a whole generation of Americans. And Lincoln hoped, Lincoln put his faith in the Constitution, he put his faith in the Union, he put his faith in the evolving sensibilities of American citizens, but he sternly rejected the project of the abolitionists. It's important here to note the distinction between somebody who's opposed to slavery, that includes a large group of people, and the abolitionists who say that slavery is so bad that it has to be at the top of anybody's list of priorities and it, it justifies overruling anything else, including the Constitution. So John Brown took the position that emancipation outranks the Constitution. Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln put it just the other way around. Not that he was any less opposed to, than Brown to slavery, but he believed that the Constitution was the only sure guarantee of all American freedoms. And his position was that if emancipation should come, but the Constitution should collapse, then American freedoms generally be worse off than they had been before. Now, of course, Lincoln was also a practicing politician or he wanted to get back into politics. So he had to sign on to that agenda in order to be at all plausible. The book also covers some of his complex, now we would consider deeply problematic views on race, you know, about equality, race mixing, and what to do with all of those enslaved people if they were freed. All of this emerges in the debates on record. Can you give us a little sense of that? Sure. So first I'll say that one of the appeals of abolitionism, one of the appeals of the position of John Brown is you don't bother with the complexities of the issue. You don't ask yourself, well, what's going to happen to these slaves after they're freed. How are they gonna live? Where are they gonna live? How is the rest of society gonna deal with them? You just say, basically, that's not my problem. That's God's problem or somebody else's problem. But for a practicing politician like Lincoln, that's crucial, especially since Lincoln has committed himself to persuading enough Southern slaveholders that slavery is not in their interest anymore to get them to do what New York and Massachusetts and Pennsylvania had done, voluntarily end the institution of slavery. So Lincoln had to deal with the, fun, the, the basic problems. Well, it was easy for Massachusetts to end slavery because there were hardly any slaves in Massachusetts. So the question of what do you do about the former slaves? Well, it's not a big issue because there aren't very many of them. But tell somebody in South Carolina that, where 45% of the population consists of slaves. You've got this country that is hoping to be a democracy. This, by the way, is something that's important to note, that Lincoln's generation was a generation that could not take American democracy for granted. It was still an experiment. And this is why Lincoln was so insistent that when the seven and then 11 Southern states seceded, he said, this cannot be allowed to happen because it will destroy democracy. And the you know, last best hope of, of mankind is gonna go away. People will demonstrate they can't govern themselves. So Lincoln has to persuade them. And, and so one of, the, and he also could not point to any successful biracial republic in the world or in world history. And he, so he understood it. there are gonna be problems. This is one of the reasons that he thought, and he was following the path of, a, of Thomas Jefferson on this one. Jefferson was opposed to slavery, but he also believed that once we free the slaves, we have to 
basically get them all to go back to Africa or somewhere else because we can't leave them around as Jefferson put it, as Lincoln put it. And they both said essentially the same thing on this subject. And that is white people in this country have done so many wrongs to black people that the black people will never be able to forgive them. So they can't live in peace aside of each other. And furthermore, white people having denigrated black people for so long, they can't live with them either. And so they, Lincoln was thinking, okay, uh, I don't wanna give up democracy. I wanna get rid of slavery. And so the only thing we can do is free the slaves and then cause them all to go back to Africa or go to the West Indies somewhere. But this was, this was a non-starter because most of them didn't wanna go. You know, they were more American than very many people who had emigrated to America long after the ancestors of the slave, enslaved people had come to America. Well, we definitely want, there are a number of questions here about emancipation and the war, but first we have to, of course, talk about the raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859. So this is right at the crux, uh, the run up to an election year, the important 1860 election. This begins a little earlier than planned uh, after their band were camping out and got, got made at a local farmhouse and drew suspicion. So you get this play-by-play -play of well, just an unbelievable story of first, the fairly easy capture of the armory there, but then seizing locals, including the great grandnephew of George Washington, <laughs> just of all people. And presumably this is to rouse the enslaved people uh, to their cause Washington, however, thought they were insane or joking. How did others respond? Well, so yeah, exactly. So John Brown leased a farm several miles from Harper's Ferry and he presented himself as a cattle buyer. So he would buy cattle and he'd fatten them up and then send them north to markets. And so he had presented himself as this relatively harmless guy. And then when it turns out that he is, well, actually he was commonly called Osawatomi Brown because he had led the anti-slavery militia in Kansas territory at the Battle of Osawatomie Creek, which is sometimes called the first battle of the Civil War, because the first time organized forces fought. Most of the fighting in Kansas was quite irregular, but this was one where there are actual two militias that went at it, and John Brown was Osawatomie Brown. Anyway, so when they discovered that this is the guy, oh my gosh, this is very strange. But the, in the case of Lewis Washington, uh, his, his home is entered in the middle of the night by these people he doesn't know, and he's told that he has to come with them. And he also has to hand over his weapons. And meanwhile, the slaves on the property are being told that they should come along too, but they should come along and join the army for their freedom. And they're really reluctant about this because nobody told them about this. Nobody says, you know, what this is going to lead to. They've never heard of this guy that's going to be heading this army. Now, John Brown, just before the raid on Harper's Ferry, called a meeting with Frederick Douglass, the former slave, the very noted abolitionist, and who John Brown had met Frederick Douglass some years before. And he had shared with Douglass his plans for handing out weapons to slaves in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry, because there was a federal arsenal there, you take the weapons and you give them to the slaves in all the area. And the slaves use those weapons to strike for their freedom. And so if, and John Brown said to Frederick Douglass, if you come along, if the slaves that we appeal to see that you're part of this, then all of a sudden I have far more credibility than I would otherwise. And Frederick Douglass said, nah, I don't think so. I mean, basically what he said is, I'm a writer, not a fighter. But secondly, but secondly, he knew that John Brown's raid was in effect a suicide mission because Frederick Douglass had been a slave. And he understood that the first thing the slaves would do is ask themselves, okay, what am I getting into here? As bad as slavery is, I don't wanna go to immediate death. And as soon as I take up weapons, then that is a capital crime in any slave state for a slave to take up weapons. And I will be murdered and I will be killed. And I'll only do this if there's a reasonable chance that this will succeed. And I'll wait and see if there's any reasonable chance to succeed. The other thing is that John Brown discovered to his chagrin um, that Harper's Ferry is really easy to get into, but it's hard to get out of. 
So actually getting into town, especially when nobody was expecting an attack, they come in in the middle of the night and there are a couple of sleepy guards around the armory there and they're able to force their way into the armory, but they are res resisted by one guy first, uh, ironically, the first person, the first casualty was a black man. Um, and then uh, some shots are fired and the town wakes up and they realize, oh my gosh, there is this attack. And once the town wakes up and realizes there's attack, then it's curtains for John Brown and the other people who are there because it's Harper's Ferry is the, there are a couple of rivers that come together there and then there are steep hills to climb. And it's really easy to aim your weapons down on the armory, the arsenal. And so John Brown and his small band, some of them are killed and the others are pinned down in this engine house, a brick building that could resist the, the fire. And they hold up there for a while until Robert E. Lee shows up at the head of a company of US Marines. And Lee doesn't mess around and he orders the, the storming of the engine house and Brown is taken prisoner. He's nearly killed. And he would have been killed if one of the soldiers, well, actually an officer entering the engine house hadn't been in such a hurry to join the force going north. He reached for a saber and instead of getting the real saber, he got a ceremonial saber, which when he whacked John Brown over the head, it just folded in two. It left a, a scalp wound that bled like crazy and matted John Brown's hair, but it didn't kill him. And so if, if it had killed him, then the John Brown story would have ended right there. And it would have had nothing like the effect it had either in the North or in the South, but it didn't kill John Brown and he lives to stand trial. The trial is just a, 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 a pretty dramatic, almost surreal scene at points. Um, he's wounded, as you said, during the capture and, and he attends the jury selection and the trial from a cot that's trundled in day by day. And, you know, every now and again, pulls it out from his chin and bolts up and says something and then comes right back down. It is almost, it, it's almost comic in its own way, but, but we've got to move forward. So I want to ask, what did this performance that he did at the trial, which was pretty uh, dramatic, have, what, what effect did that have on public opinion? There are a number of different realms here. It polarized public opinion. Now, public opinion was already pretty polar, polarized between North and South, but this, this pushed it beyond repair because John Brown was tried, convicted, executed. On his way to the gallows, he slipped a note to his jailer in which he said that the crimes of this land shall not be purged away except by blood. And John Brown was prophesying that there would be blood before there was an end to slavery. And John Brown comported himself with great dignity, impressing even his captors. The governor of Virginia was very impressed by John Brown. And so John Brown was hanged to Northerners. And, and at that point, at that point, even Southerners who thought that John Brown was this terrorist kind of guy. They had to sort of grant him grudging credit for comporting himself very well during the trial. But then what happened was John Brown's death was treated as a martyrdom in the North. And John Brown was, he was proclaimed the next Jesus Christ, someone who gave his life for the freedom of the slaves. And when White Southerners saw this, they thought, oh my gosh, what kind of a country do we live in? Where somebody who murdered my fellow Southerners, who tried to raise our slaves against us, and in a way that might have left us all dead in our beds, when he is hailed as a hero by the North, Southerners, white Southerners said, this is a country that is not safe for the institution of slavery. This is a country that is not safe for our very lives. So of course, this is what we're, heads into the election of 1860 when Lincoln does win, but he is now the president of a completely divided nation, right? And, and all sorts of, if, if, there, if there are any echoes here, um, some people threaten to disregard the results. 
there was plenty of slander that uh, Lincoln was part of the John Brown network, that his running mate was part Negro, quote unquote. So he loses every single Southern state, becomes president of this divided nation that is soon at war. And all of these questions here about are about what pushed him to the Emancipation Proclamation. Joe asks, which abolitionist figure influenced his decision the most to issue the Emancipation Proclamation? Did it affect him at all? Of course, he was trying to distance himself from the John Browns of the world. Um, another one here, can you comment on the abolitionist feelings on Lincoln conducting a war to save the Union during the first two years of the Civil War and not a war to end slavery? So can, can, you, can you try and tie some of these together as we're talking about what happens? Lincoln completely silent after his election to the inauguration, doesn't say anything to address the anxieties that are building for secession in the country. Yes, so, so this question of Lincoln's silence is one that has puzzled historians. It certainly puzzled his contemporaries. Lincoln's position was, I will not give any promises to the states that are contemplating secession. I have made my position clear in the campaign and in my speeches before that. And if I simply repeat myself, they won't take me seriously. Now, that was, sounds to me kind of like a rationalization because anybody knows there's a fundamental difference between saying something as a candidate for office and saying something as president elect. Now you're gonna be the guy. And people wanna know if you still take seriously what you said before. So I think that was a strategic mistake by Lincoln. But once he became president, once he was inaugurated, he made very clear, first of all, that he would not tolerate secession. His perception of his understanding of the constitution, the one that he had sworn to uphold and defend, meant the constitution for every state in the union. The states, the con his constitution did not allow states to secede. Secondly, he made very clear that his opposition to secession had nothing to do with slavery. For Abraham Lincoln, the war for the first two years, not quite first two years, from inauguration the beginning of 1861 to the issue of the Emancipation Proclamation, beginning of 1863, Lincoln took the position that the war was all about states' rights, or more precisely, it was about his interpretation of states' rights as not including the right to secede. And he was asked by Horace Greeley, the anti-slavery editor of the anti-slavery New York Tribune. And Greeley was pushing Lincoln to say, look, call this a war about slavery. And that way we can get all the abolitionists on our side. Frederick Douglass, who knew Lincoln by this time, was saying, this is a, come on, you know this is a war about slavery. You might as well say it's a war about slavery and make it a war about slavery. But Lincoln said no, first of all, because his interpretation of the Constitution still held. The President of the United States, nor Congress, had any authority to tell Virginia, to tell Georgia, to tell Mississippi that they couldn't have slaves. If they wanted to have slaves till time forever, that was their prerogative under Lincoln's interpretation of the Constitution. But secondly, and this is crucial to remember, not all the slave states seceded. And there were four border states, and especially including Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland. If Maryland seceded, and if Lincoln declared this a war against slavery, then Maryland, a slave state, would have almost no choice but to join the Confederacy. And once ha that happened, the Union government would have to evacuate Washington, D.C. And it would be very much harder to hold the Ohio River, to hold the Mississippi River. And so Lincoln knew that on constitutional grounds and on strategic grounds, making this a war against slavery would be counterproductive. Finally, Lincoln knew that the North was hardly unified in favor of waging a war against slavery. After the shelling of Fort Sumter in April, 1861, Lincoln issued a call for volunteers. And he said it was volunteers to save the Union. If Lincoln had issued a call for 75,000 volunteers to free the slaves, he wouldn't have gotten anywhere near 75,000. Opinion in the North was by no means universal behind freeing the slaves for some of the reasons I mentioned. And just the fact that for most Northerners, slavery wasn't that big a deal. It was a really big deal for people like John Brown and people who you know, were full-time abolitionists. But for most people in the North, maybe they were mildly opposed, but to risk my life to go to war for it, I don't think so. When did that shift? Because uh, that, that explanation also gives cover to the Jefferson Davies, Davises who say, you know, this isn't about slavery, this is about states' rights. Well, so ironically, yeah, what Lincoln's position in the first part of the war was the, the position that Southerners would take after the war and saying that this wasn't about slavery, but strikingly, 
at the beginning of the war, in most of the ordinances of, of secession of the states to secede, slavery is clearly identified as the proximate cause. Now, the seceding states all say that every state, including Massachusetts and New York, have a right to secede. But they also all understood you don't do this for just any reason at all. No, you do it because you feel that some basic interest is endangered. And they all, nearly all, identified slavery as that basic interest that was endangered. So, um, so anyway, Lincoln initially takes the position that this isn't about slavery, this is about states' rights, so the lack of a state's right to secede. But he is worked upon by people like Horace Greeley and Frederick Douglass, but furthermore by his own generals who say, look, the slaves in the South are a war resource. They provide the labor that keep the Confederate army in the field. And whatever we can do to diminish the effectiveness of that labor force, we should do. And you know, if you promise freedom to the slaves, then it will encourage slaves to abandon the plantations, to abandon their masters and head to union lines. And maybe, maybe we'll use them as soldiers of our own. Well, that seemed to be a dicier issue. There was another angle that was at play that's often overlooked. And that is the role of Britain in all of this. Everybody alive in the 1860s knew the story of the American Revolution and it succeeded only with the help of a foreign power, France. The Confederacy knew that its attempt at independence of doing in 1861 what the colonies did in 1776 was going to require the help of a foreign power, ideally Britain, which was dependent on Southern cotton. And Britain was tempted to recognize the independence of the Confederacy. And if it did that, then it would have been a great boon to Confederate hopes. But Britain had ended slavery within the empire 30 years before. And there was this moral and political and emotional opposition to slavery in Britain. And the idea of recognizing a slave holding republic, a one that owed its existence to its embrace of slavery, was a really tough political sell. But as long as Lincoln was saying, this isn't about slavery, then there's no difference between North and South and the British could follow their economic interests. So to prevent that happening, Lincoln realized, okay, I better make this a war about slavery so the British will know if you just stay neutral, that effectively helps us, the North, and that helps the cause of anti-slavery. If you support the South, then in effect, you're overturning 30 years of your own policy and supporting slavery. Hmm. Fascinating, fascinating turn there. It wasn't all of the abolitionists, but actually the support of Britain. But you, you do point out in the book, of course, that the, the irony that Lincoln's political path leads to far more bloodshed than John Brown's radical uh, insurgency. And that in effect, it did more to advance John Brown's goal. As you just said, that all of, more than 100,000 enslaved people escaped the South to take up arms for the Union. And I'm sure you are well aware there are many contemporary historians who say that, you know, Lincoln was not, this was not about slavery for him. Um, some say he was even quite a racist, um, that this was, so he was just pushed into it. He was backed into a corner. Question here from Jim. John Lewis Gates has written that Lincoln was actually a racist who became opposed to slavery as he was impressed by the courage of African-American troops. Others say he was a clever politician, always opposed to slavery and waited till the political winds allowed him to free the slaves. How do you, how do you feel about Gates' claim? I do not use the term racist in the book because what one would call a racist in 1860 is very different from what one would call a racist in 2020. It confuses the issue. I will say this, that Lincoln acknowledged differences between the black race and the white race. He suspected that the differences were not innate, but were the result of the lack of opportunities of black people. And if, you, if you're a slave and you're not educated, then how in the world are you gonna look very smart compared to people who do have the advantage of education? But he also made very clear that he was not in favor of, for example, interracial marriage, miscegenation. And, but, but he also said that even if one acknowledged, even if one claimed, and he wasn't claiming this, but neither was he exactly denying it. But he said, even if one claimed that the white race was superior to the black race, that doesn't justify enslaving the black race. 
Because if you accept that principle, then the smart people of any race get to enslave the dumb people of any race. And that just doesn't cut it. And Lincoln would say that just because I don't want to marry a black woman doesn't mean I want to enslave her. So by modern standards, yes, you can quote Lincoln and Lincoln saying that black people all have to leave America if this is gonna work. Okay, you can quote Lincoln as saying that oh, he's, he says a lot of stuff that makes the modern sensibility kind of queasy. But it's important to note that if Lincoln, if Lincoln passed muster on those points in the year 2020, he never would have had a prayer of getting elected president in 1860. And so, you know, progress is made by people like Lincoln who have one foot squarely in their own time. And only once they have that firm footing in their own time, can they take a step in the direction of what we call the future or the right side of history. But if, if you took somebody from 2020 and dropped them back in the 1860s, they would be so removed from the people of the day that they would have no effect. Remember, we live in a democracy and you have to get people to vote for you. And if you live at a time when most white people who are all the voters in the country have their own racialistic way of thinking, then you know, if you are utterly foreign from them, you're not gonna get elected. John Brown could never have been elected president of the United States. Um, we have to wrap, but I, I just want to ask because you brought up the present, you know, just been reading a report today from Militia Watch about the rise of fringe group activity, very real threat of violence from groups who would not accept the results of the election, fears of civil war being stoked. Uh, Rob asks, you know, given the political environment and chasm between blue states, red states, the, and red states and the geographic location of the bastions of respective political parties, South and the GOP, Northeast and West for Democrats, how much of the struggle for civil rights and the universal rights that Brown and Lincoln fought for so vigorously exists today? How much of it exists today? I would say that there is a much greater appreciation of who should receive equal rights today than there was in Lincoln's day. And in Lincoln's day, there was a much greater perception than there was in say Thomas Jefferson's day or George Washington's day. The concept of human rights is something that has evolved over time. The enlightenment thinkers of Europe and America in the 1880s invented the concept of human rights. If you had told somebody in 1750 that all people have these common rights, they'd say you're crazy. But now we pretty much take that for granted. And it, we think that's something that everybody should aspire to. Nobody aspired to it in 1750. And the striking thing about American history is that it's been this progressive ascent, I'll call it an ascent, in the direction of according greater rights to more people. Uh, have we perfected that? By no means, there's a lot of work yet to be done. Well, I'm sorry, there, there are so many questions that we didn't get to. Some of them are answered in the book. Others are not, I'm afraid to say, but I really am grateful to you, Bill Brands, for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. And thanks for everybody who was watching. H.W. Brands talking there about the zealot and the emancipator, John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, and the struggle for American freedom. We encourage you to support acapella books by buying a copy from them. There's a link at the Atlanta History website and Atlanta History Center website and also at the chat link. Full schedule coming up. We have plenty more author talks. On Monday, I'm going to be speaking with Arthur Blank, a legendary Atlantan, owner of the Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta United, and now author of the book Good Company. On Wednesday, Bowling Alone author Robert Putnam has a new book out. It's called The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. I'm going to be speaking with him and his co-author, Shailen Romney Garrett. Again, full schedule and Zoom links at atlantahistorycenter.com. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you again, HW Brands, and thanks for your terrific questions. Good night.